My name is Darren Numer, and this is 28 Minutes. Standing next to me is Mr. William Harris. Mr. William Harris, tell us, where are we? You are here at the California Science Center, which is the state's official science museum. We're actually a public-private partnership, and we do not charge general admission. We're here for all the people of California to come and enjoy. We're all about stimulating curiosity and inspiring science learning in everyone. And so you come here to have great hands-on interactive experience about science. It's a place for people of all ages. Wonderful. Tell me, uh, can we get started? Absolutely. Let's go have some fun. <laughs> All right. We're on our way to the Pompeii exhibit, and that is running through till January 11. January 11th. Uh, get your butts down here, California. Okay. Oh, Randy, what's well, up there? Well, actually, what you see here is our entryway, and all of the bowls represent the celestials, our galaxy and beyond, uh -huh. and that's Krondike glass that changes color depending on how the sun hits it. It's part of our science exhibits and on the lower level we actually have a steam table representing the cesspool, the origins of life. Uh, William, while we were coming up the escalators, please tell Randy and I what you were just talking about. Uh, quickly to the white plane above you, Randy. And then? Absolutely. The California Science Center has an amazing collection of real artifacts, so our aircraft, all kinds of other objects. What What's you're looking that? at now is a T-38. That is actually a uh, supersonic jet that pilots who want to become astronauts train on and the one next to it's the F-20 and that's the last two in existence. Nice. When you parked today you probably saw something that looked like it was from the Jetsons yes, yes. and that's actually a SR-71 which was a state-of-the-art spy plane developed by Lockheed back in the late 1940s early 1950s and that particular one is the only trainer it has a double cockpit typically there was just a, a pilot in a single cockpit that reportedly could go up to Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. Randy saw that when we first pulled in, so I'm so glad you told us that. That is awesome. It's a pretty amazing piece of technology. It's solid titanium, and it only had enough fuel to get off the ground because the body would heat up from the friction from going to that speed at the edge of our atmosphere. And so what would happen is they would get it off the ground, they would do in-air fueling, and the body would heat up and expand and seal the tanks. <laughs> Thank you. Where do we go from here? We're heading upstairs to our Weingarten Special Exhibits Gallery where we have Pompeii the Exhibition. Pompeii is only here through January 11, 2015, and it is an extraordinary show. It contains 150 artifacts never traveled outside of Italy before, uh, representing life in Pompeii. Uh, this particular show opened on the East Coast. It's here and from the Science Center in Los Angeles. It's going to Seattle. Then all the artifacts go back to Italy. So it's a very special opportunity to take you back in time to 69 AD at the time of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Yeah, and, and for those of you, if you're wondering where in Italy, if you're looking at the map, isn't it like where the shoelaces are starting to crisscross? More or less, yes. Pompeii is located just south of Naples. Okay. Uh, please, where are we going now? Wow, Rand, check out that. You might like that sign in front of you. So here in Pompeii, the exhibition, uh, we want to take you back to that point in time. This is an immersive experiential exhibit. Uh, we do include an audio guide. There is a charge uh, because it's the only way we could bring this exhibit to Los Angeles. Uh, these are really precious artifacts and the installation is quite extraordinary. So we actually put all of them in the same environment you would have seen them in Pompeii. So when we walk into the exhibit, you walk into a welcome courtyard, which every home had. You'll go into a Roman garden. Uh, you'll actually then get to learn about Roman culture and the kinds of things they used every day. The Romans were amazing civil engineers. They had running water. They had sanitation systems. This is like how many years ago? 2,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> they developed the arch, which is a key structure in architecture, which enabled buildings to you know, be constructed over more than one level. And so you'll learn all about this in this exhibit. We also have a computer a CGI experience, a virtual reality eruption of Mount Vesuvius. So oh my goodness. So you get a sense of what people experienced when the top blew off the mountain. All right, well don't make us wait. Come on, let's go, let's okay, go. Let's go have some fun. Awesome. transition here into which would be the inner courtyard of a Roman home and this would be a very important space and around the courtyard you would have the bedrooms the dining room so the Romans actually in a home had structure similar to what we enjoy today you know separate space for eating and entertaining for greeting guests where you slept etc 
And, and this, of course, would be in someone of Mean's home. So you can see behind me um, like a beautiful statue. Um, here's a, a serving table and more wall paintings. But again, the goal here is to give you a feel for what is it like to be in a Roman home. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Do you have any favorites? Well, we're going to see some of my favorite objects when we move into another room. We have some artifacts in this exhibit that have never traveled outside of Italy and are some of the most exquisite examples of Roman artwork. Here we see an idealized youth. If you've been to the Getty Center, uh, you've likely seen uh, the, the youth that was actually a point of contention as to the provenance of this particular bronze statue. Oh, help but, me with, well, what did you just say there? What are you talking about? Oh, if you've been to the Getty Villa, there is a statue of an ideal youth and that was common in homes. You wanted to have statuary that represented kind of your beliefs and ideals. And so the Romans celebrated youth. And so this is a, a classic statue you'd often see of a young man, an idealized young man. And, um, and it would be a common decoration. His, uh, Randy, real quick, his eyes are just falling out. That's incredible. Is that, I take it that's common? That, that's very common to use some type of precious stone to represent the eye color. And they did different eye colors, just like all humans. Some people have brown eyes, some people have blue eyes, some people have green eyes, and so they would use different color stone to represent the eyes. Excuse me, okay, that was wonderful. I hope I caught that last part. Where are we now? We're now moving into a Pompeian dining room. And meals and feasts were a really important part of social life in Roman culture. And so here we have objects you would find in a dining room. A, a table, wall paintings. This is actually a headrest. You would have, because often your feasts would last many hours and so people would get tired and they want to recline. It's where you would conduct a lot of business. It also may be where um, uh, you were doing kind of politicking, things of that nature. So you often have those things happened over meals. So we're now transitioning into a space in the exhibit where we have common implements used in every day. So these are all cooking utensils, and a lot of them look like things we use now, skillets and um, frying pans and vases and other kinds of vessels. Hold on, hold on. I think I see some leftover, uh, 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 there's scrambled eggs in there. Is that right or no? <laughs> no, the Romans actually enjoyed a remarkable diet 2,000 years ago. You have to remember they, um, we're conquering lands all the way from what's now Great Britain, all the way to Morocco, uh, throughout the Middle East. Now when you say great diet, oh, oh my gosh, you're already sounding like you live in California. <laughs> well actually they enjoyed, because it was so fertile in that area, um, the Romans ate all kinds of proteins. They, they ate all kinds of fish and other kinds of animals. They had of course great olives you know olive oil was part of their diet figs randy and i were talking about olive oil the whole ride down here <laughs> i said he said oh i have some heartburn i'm like whoa i said it's probably because i put too much butter in that in the uh, linguine yesterday or uh, angel hair pasta he says yeah use olive oil <laughs> exactly actually uh, because of mount vesuvius uh, the soil was very fertile and so Pompeii was a, a major region for great production for making wines. So you could grow anything. Exactly. So their main exports were actually olive oil, wine, and a fish paste that was used as a condiment. Fish paste, wow. Think of that. We have clam oil, clam clamata that we use as a condiment. So right. it actually adds a lot of taste to different cuisine. It's used frequently in a lot of Asian dishes and uh, Spanish dishes and things of that nature. So you can actually see some vessels here in the exhibit that contained olive oil and wine. Oh, oh wow, oh wow, the makings of these vessels. Look at that. Wow, so did you learn how they make these? Well, they're, they're basically ba basic ceramic where you take, you know, of course, some mud and then it's placed in a kiln to bake it. Uh, but then these were designed so that they could fit between the rafters of ships because they would be transported by water throughout the Roman Empire. I get it. All of the objects you see, all the objects you see in this exhibit are authentic. So we're talking 2,000 year old yes. uh, uh, pottery. Yes, that's correct. This is 2,000 years old. And then here you can actually see, oh, 
Uh, these are just examples of ceramics and other objects that were used. So basic kind of mug and a lot of things were decorative, you know, because they wanted to be attractive on the dining room table or right. uh, in so your home. This also tells you 2,000 years ago there were chickens and there were wolves. Yes, that's correct. They were. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Please don't stop. What else do you have for us, William? Well, here you can actually see some of the really extraordinary... Uh, metallurgy. You can just see how beautiful uh, this all of the hand carving is and the onlay. Uh, the, in the middle, that's actually an oil lamp, so that would have been used for illumination in the evening. Where you're in the middle is an oil lamp. Yeah, this is an oil lamp. You can see the different vessels. They're shaped like snail shells, yeah. but that would have contained the kerosene and that would have been illuminated to provide light. Right. You stick a wick in the small part and it sucks up mm -hmm. the oil, right? Oh, that is so cool. And this is 2,000 years old. Yes. Yeah. All decorative. So, again, a great emphasis on aesthetics. You must love working here. I do. It's one of the most fun places to work. <laughs> Always new interesting things. Please, what is this? This is actually a bathtub, so this would have been found in a home. But bathtubs were not that common. More often you would go to the public baths, they would have the men's bath and the women's bath. And if you went to the baths for the men's baths, they were very much like high-end gyms that we have today. You would have, a, you would have saunas and you would have the hot sauna, the medium hot sauna, the cold splash. You would have a workout area. There would be attendants there who would provide you with towels and oils and other kinds of things. Again, it was a, a social place. You would go there and conduct business or can politic. I, can I look in, the, in it? Absolutely. Thanks. Oh, look at that. <laughs> you might have to make me a little bit bigger one, but holy goodness. So uh, you have to be horribly tempted to want to take a bath. Well, yes. I have to say, when we were working on the exhibit, we did get to visit the actual baths, and they were remarkably uh, Generous advanced. Generous and let you take a bath? No. <laughs> they weren't actually functioning, unfortunately, but uh, uh, they actually had spaces in the wall where they pumped steamed uh, air uh -huh. to heat the baths. It was remarkable technology. Still, nobody sat in it when no one was looking? Right. <laughs> Well, here we actually have some example of Roman jewelry, and this represents the wealth of the Roman Empire. I mean, this looks like something you would find at, you know, Boulevard on Rodeo Drive. But this that, is, is this 24 karat gold? It is. Get out of here. And this, look how fine that is. It's actually braided gold. And this is without a, that's without a magnifying glass. Yes. The one thing about gold is when it was pulled out of the ash, it looked this way. Gold doesn't tarnish. No. And so when it was recovered, it looked this way. You can actually see an interesting arm bracelet here with a snake pattern. And this is a great example of the confluence of cultures coming together. So it was very popular in Egypt to have arm bracelets with snake bands on them. Sure. So this one was found actually in Pompeii. Wow. So that means someone brought that or was inspired by Egyptian art. And they had pierced ears, I take it? Or yes. are those, uh, those uh, clip-ons? No, they were pierced. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and so, rings too. What, oh, what else are you showing us? Well, I wanted to actually take you over here to show you the statue of Venus. You know, of course, Venus is the goddess of love, and this is one of the very rare examples of a hey. original. Yes, you're right. You saw it. It's very unusual to find a Roman statue that still has the paint on it because the stone surface is so hard over time it just peels off or wears off. Sure. But this is very special. This is one of my favorite objects yeah, in the too. installation. Mine too. And I'm so mad her fingers are going on our right hand. Well, you think it She's withstood. Well, you think of what it withstood <laughs> 2,000 years and the eruption of a <laughs> volcano and earthquakes. Yeah, Lee press ons don't work the way they used to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. I love the paint. Love the yes. paint. Well, who, who's, standing next, who's standing next to her? Well, again, this is a, a male statue, and so often you would have representations of individuals. It wouldn't necessarily be someone. Sometimes it is. For example, we actually have a, a portrait bust here of Julius Who's Caesar's this? son. Julius Caesar's son. No way. Who's... And so you would often do this as a way of showing respect. Uh, and so this is Gaius Caesar. And yes. And you would have portrait busts as a way of showing respect. Like you might have a portrait in your home of the President of the United States. Well, right, you would have a portrait right, right, right. George, uh, Washington. George Washington or someone. Exactly. Sure. So you would have important figures or family members uh, represented through busts. Like 
they didn't do painting portraits as much. They like to do portrait busts. Yeah. That's that's sharp as ever, and of, of course that's real marble. Yes. Yeah, these would be mostly made out of marble, uh, sometimes alabaster or some other stone. I love how it looks like in the hair. It looks like it's got. Uh, he's going out to the club and he's got glitter. Well, you have to remember that the Romans were very stylish, and they had different hairstyles like we do. And there would be periods of time when facial hair was in style or not, and that's actually one way to date when these busts were made based on the hairstyles. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're. Like today, you had hair salons for men and women. You would yeah. go and you'd have your hair cut and styled. And probably at the spa. Yes. <laughs> What's up next? What's here next? Oh, war. Ugh. What we're about to look at is considered the most exquisite gladiator armament ever recovered. And so these are actually done oh in best. Goodness. You can't see it, but I'm saying I'm sorry, William, I cut you off. Love, oh my lord, look at this. What are you showing us, my friend? What you're looking at here is the most exquisite gladiator armament ever recovered. This is done in bas relief, and it represents the Battle of Troy. And so if you look around the helmet, you can actually see a depiction of the battle, and also on the leg protectors. This would have been more of a ceremonial outfit that would have been used probably in processions, things of that nature. You're getting a medal. Right. This is kind of... 2,000 years ago football. I mean, this was <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> their version of a popular sport and entertainment where the public would come together. And uh, so again, this would be more for parading and ceremonial. They actually had other gladiator wear that would have been used for more so in battle. Okay. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. The, uh, the interest, uh, the, say that word for me, intricacy. The intricacy, right, yes. It's we good. said it together. It's actually um, probably- well, What was that question? It's made of, the metal is bronze, and it's bas relief, which means that they would uh, hammer the um, bronze until it was very thin, and then they would actually use a mold, and they would hammer the bronze over the mold to actually <laughs> depict it. And then they would, you know, of course, work it to get the, the fine detail. I mean, you can just see the handiwork on this is really quite remarkable. Wow. Well, on the very end here, you actually see what's left of a bronze statue of a boxer because boxing was also a popular sport. Boxer, wait, hold on, he's cheating there. He's got some they, knuckles. They got some brass, brass knuckles. knuckles. They are actually brass knuckles. <laughs> 2,000 year old brass knuckles. Uh, and the next... Here, I thought we were giving that award to the mafia. All right, well, God love them. <laughs> so in the next case, we have more gladiator armament, and you can see this was used. Um, and there are also some small figurines and you would have these as decorative items in your home, the little terracotta gladiator soldiers. Trinkets. Mm -hmm. Love it. Uh, what's, who's here Jewish? Anybody here Jewish? What, what, uh, what's the word for knickknacks in Jewish? Tchotchkes. Tchotchkes, thank you. Yes. Yeah, these are the tchotchkes, I love that. Hebrew. Yes. And Hebrew, thank you. So the other thing you see here is the Romans actually were fairly advanced in medical treatment. These are actually medical devices. So this is a speculum. Thank you, you can see um, other types of medical devices. They don't look terribly different from things that we use today. Right. Tweezers. <laughs> yes. Um, and then in the next case, you can actually see some elements of Roman plumbing. They actually had running water and also drainage systems oh, and, hydro and hydraulic That's valves. Yeah. Randy, you knew that was a hydraulic? So again, I would describe the bathhouses. The bathhouses actually, uh, they had a way of heating the water, creating steam, and the steam was pumped through spaces in the walls to create the steam rooms. We're now going to go into the adult space. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh the, <laughs> I read about, I was doing my homework, and I, it was said that a lot of times this is not shown at all. Oh my goodness, uh, William, above your head it reads, oh by the way, real quick, I want you to know we're, our next exhibit, I, I painted them gold brown for y'all. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, but above your head it says, erotic imagery, and oh my, are we going to get in trouble? Well, this is an adult area under parental supervision. Okay. You have to remember, Pompeii was the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. It's where you went to have a good time. Oh, the don't ask, don't tell? Yes, and so there were more than 46 bordellos, and they had both uh, women and men available. And so this particular room depicts something that was a really important part of Roman society. I'm blushing. 
And in here we have imagery that you would have found inside the bordello. We have a video that talks about the lives of the service people in that space and then some of the other artifacts you would have seen in the bordellos of Pompeii. All right, let's go on in there so we can stop looking at me giggling like a little schoolgirl or teenage boy. Okay. <laughs> Either or. Well, because it was an erotic space, you would have uh, people in positions, uh, in different sexual positions, and uh, then other artifacts of, that you would have found in that space. So, charms, uh, other kinds of uh, illumination. Charms? Wow, what do you know? Look at those. What's that he's looking at? Well, there are different cut types of erotica that would have been used as adornments in that space. Actually, some of the Pompeian residents had their own playrooms, their own erotica rooms. They didn't necessarily go to the bordellos. And then the bordellos were also social places where they would have halls where you would entertain and have very special kinds of parties. So these are just some artifacts that were recovered from the from the bordello. All right, why not? Yes, and you celebrate all, all of life, I say. Where are we headed now? heading toward the um, Eruption Theater. And this is a, a theater when you come to visit where we have a virtual reality experience of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius actually erupted over the course of 24 hours. There were five major eruptions and the lava was so hot, it's what we call a pyroclactic flow where the lava was vaporized into ash and pumice. So you didn't have lava flow, you had superheated air with ash and pumice. What is pumice? Pumice is actually a lava stone that's dry and has a lot of air in it. So it, and you buy it nowadays as an exfoliant for your feet. There are people that use a pumice stone to rub to take off. That's the what a pumice stone is. All right. It's actually, it's lava stone that has like holes in it. It's very, very light. So when Mount Vesuvius erupted, you had this column of ash and pumice going up into the air. So it was very light. It mixed with moisture in the air and then fell to the ground. And that's what covered Vesuvius and the, the areas surrounding the mountain. In fact, when people were trying to escape by water, because Vesuvius was a port at one time, I'm sorry, uh, Pompeii was a port, as were other cities like Herculaneum. Right, because they're next to the water. Correct. The pumice was so light, it floated on top of the water and it lifted up the boats and people couldn't get away by sea. Pumice. Randy, would this be the same thing that we have in our backyard that looks like a, ra a giant raindrop? You said that was a volcano thing? He called it. A, I think we have one of those things. Now, was did that go up into the air and come down and knock people in the head? Yes, yeah, some people were hit by the stones as they were falling out of the air. Even though they're light, they must have hurt. Yes, well, there were people who were killed by that, <laughs> and so what? Pe most people succumb to the heat. So often they say it was the gases, but it really wasn't the gases that killed people. The temperature of the air. You have to remember Mount Vesuvius was nine miles north of Pompeii and it was the air currents that carried the south and then the ash and pumice rained down on the city and then these flows came and it was actually the fifth paracoctic flow that came and that really took out Pompeii but people died from the heat it was 300 degrees Fahrenheit can I dare ask a <laughs> dumb question w were there any survivors yes because the, the initial pyroclactic flows from Mount Vesuvius came as far as or close to the city wall of Pompeii. And people, if they left, could have survived. But there were people who stayed and they thought, we'll just p power through this. Get out, right. sure. So it's actually a great example of disaster preparedness. And, and we say the same thing here in Los Angeles. We know we're going to have the big one or major earthquakes. Let's go. Let's go. And so you had to be prepared for it. And you've got to no, it could happen in your lifetime, and if it does, you want to be as prepared as you can be. So we need to have our earthquake kits prepared and our thunderstorm, really bad thunderstorm, flooding kit prepared. No our routes of evacuation prepared. Exactly. You realize your, your mobile phone's not going to work. <laughs> you know what? I did not realize that. Son of a... <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd have about a battery, an extra battery, or no, we're out of, we're out of power. Uh, you know, you keep your phone charged. You keep your gas tank pretty full most of the time right. you know you should sleep that with so not me sleep with slip slippers or shoes next to your bed because yeah. if windows break you can cut your feet on sharp objects right. you need to make sure you have water and a weak supply of water you're so helping me with my list yeah it's all important all of this is available online actually in the california science center's website as well Sweet. under our disaster preparedness area
we'll take a look at that too and uh, we'll give you a little website head site so you can go and check it out uh, there's a lot of noise in the background but that is all because there's a beautiful film that is demonstrating an earthquake uh, a volcano, volcano eruption, eruption. Volcanic eruption. Uh, but we're not going to put that on film because uh, you got to come out here to the Science Center and see it for yourself William where are we now well we've come to the end of the exhibit where we have a few additional experiences that we added on talking about current volcanoes because there are volcanoes erupting all the time. I mean there's a volcano erupting right now on the big island of Hawaii. There was a major volcano that took many people's lives in Japan that was also a pyroclactic flow. The very same type of eruption happened in Mount St. Helens uh, here in the United States and so volcanoes are part of our everyday lives. We live in this little crust on earth and it's remarkable more things don't happen but that's why we have earthquakes and volcanoes. These are just natural phenomena and we do the best we can to try to endure them when they happen. So we include in the gallery some examples of recent major pyroclactic flow volcanoes. Uh, we also have an interactive experience here where you can actually cause a volcano to erupt and understand oh, that's what the science looking at right now. This science of volcanoes. Lava dome volcano. So we talk about the, the different types of volcanoes here and you can actually see video depictions of those. And we talk about um, how Earth has a molten core and there are pressures that are pushing this magnum up to the surface. And which has to be. It has to be that way. That's just where Earth is made. And then we look at some Roman architecture here where you can build arches. Oh, I mean, it really was an architectural depiction. Haha, <laughs> you got a little spot for the kids. I love that. And then we also have um, a representation here of some work that the Getty Conservation Institute here in Los Angeles is doing to help with conservation I'm of the wall Getty. paintings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, conservation you... of wall paintings uh, in Herculaneum which was a smaller town that was also destroyed that was closer to Mount Vesuvius. This is, oh, one nearby. Yes. This particular one is a replica, but it gives you an opportunity to, to learn about what they're doing and how to do structural diagnosis of a wall. That picture right there, did you see that? <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. The um, big challenge with the wall paintings, one is the reason they established towns in Herculaneum and Pompeii was because there was water, they're natural springs. And the Romans had a whole system of drainage so the water could be drained away. Well, those systems are all clogged and so in Herculaneum, the dry walls are like wicks. The water's going up the wall that creates moisture and it is help making the wall paintings peel off the walls. So basically they figured out if we open up the Roman drainage systems, it'll help take care of that. And so they're using Roman technology. Nice. Uh, but they're also looking at how earlier archaeologists put wax in the walls and that is causing the paint to chip off as well. They're using lasers to remove those. So here we talk about the remarkable work the Getty Conservation Institute is doing to help develop techniques to preserve this, this incredible treasure and time capsule. <sighs> You're just a treasure box of beautifulness. Um, we can't thank you enough. Uh, My pleasure. You, absolute, you absolutely rock. Thank you, William Harris, and thank you, California Science Center, for a wonderful afternoon. Uh, we encourage everyone out there to come out here and uh, come visit and see the sites. It's more than you'll be able to handle, and uh, it's more than you'll be able to pay for because it's free. Again, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Please come back soon. You got it. I hope so.